Hello, everyone. My name is Don Gibbs, and I'm the CEO at the Skoll Foundation. I'm excited to welcome you to this Skoll World Forum session that will dig deeper in what needs to be done to build a roadmap for healthcare, decarbonization, resilience, and equity. I've been invited by the Healthcare Without Harm team to open with some framing remarks. But let me start with some logistical items. The session is being recorded and will be released publicly after the event. Please feel free to use the chat to engage with each other and ask questions of the speakers. The session is scheduled to last for 90 minutes. Please take a few seconds to complete the survey that we'll post here at the end of the session. And please use the hashtag NumberSkullWorldForum on social media so that we can get the word out about this great, great session. Now for the fun part. I'm honored to be invited to offer some framing remarks because this topic holds so much resonance for us at the Skull Foundation and also for the world at this critical time in our history. Over the past year, the pandemic spotlighted how our health systems and health outcomes are fundamentally tied to governance, economic, social, and environmental systems. We learned that a broken piece in one of these systems will inevitably lead to fissures in the others. Systemic inequities will continue to reverberate, especially among our most overlooked communities, unless we diagnose and treat the system as a whole. No human lives a single life issue life and we as philanthropy and social innovators can't either. For 25 years, Healthcare Without Harm and its network of 1500 partners in 73 countries have known this. They are a systems orchestrator in the global health system. And for decades, they've helped so many in the field to come to terms with the climate crisis is a health and equity crisis. As a result of all this work, Healthcare Without Harm has become a backbone NGO for the global healthcare sector as it steps into the fray for climate solutions that improve health and heal intergenerational inequities. During the COVID crisis, we've witnessed how the health sector sits at the epicenter of our collective trauma. We are also confident that it can play a powerful role in our collective healing. Over the past year, I've taken to looking for bright spots to keep my hopes up. I want, want to share a few of the bright spots with you all. Healthcare Without Harm is working with the World Bank to design a strategy to invest billions of dollars in pandemic prepared and climate resilient health systems in low and middle income countries around the world. They are working with the United Nations Development Program to design and socialize purchasing standards to drive billions of dollars of low carbon and toxic free products and technologies through the UN system and health ministries worldwide. Finally, they are working with the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change as their healthcare partner on the Race to Zero initiative that is building examples worldwide for institutions to commit to zero emissions in alignment with the Paris Climate Treaty. And today, they're rolling out a roadmap to guide hospitals and health systems worldwide to chart their journey to zero emissions healthcare. We are so thrilled to be able to include this session in this year's virtual Skull World Forum and want to extend a special thank you to Healthcare Without Harm for proposing it and designing it. With that, I'd like to introduce today's moderator, Gary Cohn, co-founder and president of Healthcare Without Harm. Gary's been a real teacher to me in my two years here at the Skull Foundation and someone I'd look to as a true exemplar of social innovation. Gary, over to you. Thanks so much, Don, for the introduction. And I'm so impressed with the transformation you've led at the Skull Foundation over the last couple of years. When I first received the Skoll Award in 2006, the focus was on the social entrepreneur as the agent of change and how to scale that person's innovation. 
The collective myth was about the social entrepreneur on the hero's journey. I remember when uh, I got the award at the ceremony, I was given a plaque by Ben Kingsley and Robert Redford. So on one side of me was the Sundance Kid, on the other side was Gandhi. It was a lot to live up to. And as the foundation in the field progressed, and so many social entrepreneurs left their organizations to start new ventures, we saw that the organizations thrived. And so the, the locus of change moved to the organization. How do we scale that organization to go to more communities and more countries? But now that we see that the narrative is evolving again, as evidenced by this forum, it's the ecosystem that works together to transform society, to win elections, to topple dictators. It's the many players and organizations working in alignment across multiple entry points that leads to social transformation. And it's the intersection between global health and racial justice and women's rights and climate resilience and an equitable economy and defending democracy, all are critical strands in a tapestry of a world that we are creating together. So on behalf of all of us, we're grateful to you and to Jeff Skoll and the Skoll team for helping us weave this new vision together. Our work is one of the strands in this tapestry. It starts from the simple observation that you can't have healthy people on a sick planet. If you wanna create the conditions for health on the planet, we need to heal the economy and its reliance on fossil fuels, on toxic chemicals, on industrial agriculture, all of which are driving a global pandemic of chronic disease and environmental destruction on an epic scale. And there is no better sector to advance this broader healing mission than the healthcare sector, whose work is underpinned by an ethical imperative to first do no harm, the Hippocratic Oath. It's the only sector with healing as its mission. And it also represents 10% of the global economy and 20% of the US economy. So it has enormous economic clout to drive innovation and to transform markets. So we've been building the strategies and tools and ecosystem over the last 25 years to leverage all of the assets of the healthcare sector, its purchasing power, its investments, its workforce development, its moral standing, its political power to model the transition to a sustainable and equitable economy that's climate resilient for all of us. And another crucial part of the strategy is to build a movement inside of the healthcare sector for climate justice, to leverage the trusted voices of healthcare workers to reframe the climate crisis, to be a public health emergency, and to promote solutions and policies that align with communities and help build a much broader movement for planetary survival. The COVID epidemic, as you say, has further elevated health professionals as truth tellers and critical messengers for public health. So we're building on this trust to activate an army of health partners around the world as storytellers and advocates for policies to accelerate our transformation to a renewable energy economy where health and equity are baked in as essential ingredients. So in this session, we hope to accomplish two things. One, we're going to hear from Healthcare of the Harm and our partners about how we're working toward a common goal of aligning the health sector with the broader ambitions of the Paris Climate Treaty. And second, we're going to integrate poetry, song, and video into this session because we all learn in multiple ways. And these art forms help us touch our common humanity and the deepest wellsprings of our inspiration. And also, it's the way we roll at the health scale, at the Skoll Forum. So I'd like to start by introducing, and I'm honored to introduce Juan Felipe Herrera, the poet laureate emer emeritus, emeritus of the United States, who wrote a poem uh, specifically for this event to share with us. Welcome, Juan. Thank you so much. It's a, it's a, uh, I'm really honored to be here with you, and I'm really uh, inspired um, by your mission and project, which is also all of our mission, as you have stated, and uh, your your focused heart and mind on the on humanity, on the earth, and our bodies, 
in crisis and cities in crisis. So I really appreciate this invitation uh, for me to write a poem and I, uh, I did and it's uh, for everyone and thanks, thank you once again. And uh, I wanna thank everyone that uh, was instrumental in getting me here and inviting me to this, uh, to this moment. Uh, uh, Ralph Lewin, Josh Carliner, Pam Wilner and everyone, muchas gracias. And thank you everyone for uh, lending your voice and your uh, intelligence, research and commitment uh, to this amazing, incredible um, uh, project of change, social transformation, as you said. Uh, this poem is titled, We Shall Build a New House Green, an anthem for healthcare without harm. We shall build a new house green. We shall build it with oceans and eucalyptus leaves with the agreements of all things. It shall be a healing house. The healing shall be for all. Breathing free, children, climate, breathing free, fossil fuel gone, and gas, and oil, and coal gone, and every floor there will be a bowl of kindness, nurses, and emergency room doctors, and first responders. At the center of every community, this house green, at the center of every nation, an island radiating beyond. Can you see it now? It will be a fountain. It will be a source of compassion, a floor without carbon, the walls and rooms and stations without plastic. We shall build it with the permission of the mountains of thunder face, the stirring light of immeasurable dreams of all realized. Our house shall flourish, green and solarizing flowers, solarizing hope, solarizing earth, its cities in crisis, as the Arctic wolf prowling for sustenance on the last snow sliding on the watery shards of permafrost. Our eyes shall cast their gaze upon the lives of all with wholeness, without micro poisons, piercing the cells and span of all living things, all shall taste the joyous flower of life. Yes, we shall know happiness. We shall know the healing of earth and sky. We shall know the liberation of HCFCs. We shall know witness and we will witness our existence genuine. We shall make this house with a new idea, how to bend time with our hearts and minds, each one of us tasking unity, humanity, and the planetary scope of compassion, ethics, perseverance, and radical reimagination in every hall, in every room, in every foundation and roof and every beam, and weaving there will be nature and peoples breathing. There shall be a rainbow, a garden of ancestral offerings. We shall open the doors of our healing house green. There shall be a choir and movement in harmony. Many lives will survive and sing hope in every space. The healing shall be for all the future saved, the voice of all, life granted and shared, and the planet Earth holy. We shall build this house with irrefutable sky. The wisdom of life shall be painted on every pathway with giant sequoia leaves, with ocean songs determined and courageous for humanity, healing, healing, turquoise and green. Thank you so much, Juan, for that wonderful, wonderful introduction. So during the last year of the pandemic, we've been busy developing a global roadmap for healthcare decarbonization with our partner, Arup, 
and a technical advisory group of key experts from around the world. The goal is both simple and incredibly complex to chart a course for the health sector to reach zero emissions. And in doing so, we are confident we can reduce the burden of disease around the world and help transform the immoral logic of an economy that has externalized public health and environmental harm and capitalized on racial injustice as central operating principles. To introduce the roadmap, I'd like to introduce Josh Carliner, who is the International Director of Program and Strategy for Healthcare Weather Harm, and Sonia Roshnik, our International Climate Policy Director, who until recently was at the National Health Service and was one of the architects in building their strategy to achieve zero emissions. Josh, Sonia, welcome to the School Forum. Thank you, Gary. Um, and Juan Felipe, gracias. Increíble. When we first approached Juan Felipe to write a poem for this event, um, we knew it was going to be good, but that was just amazing and so powerful and so moving. So thank you so much. Um, now, with those incredible words, I'm not sure what we're going to do, Sonia. How do we how do we follow that act? Well, all I can think of is that we need to draw a map, maybe a roadmap for a journey of transformation. Okay, well, let's let's try that. Um, and um, if we can, we're going to get some images up here on the screen. While you're doing that, maybe I can say how delighted we are to be here today to give a snapshot of this global healthcare decarbonization roadmap. It's really about fundamental systems change like we've been hearing about so the health sector globally can achieve its part in developing a climate just, healthy and resilient world. I hope we can do it justice today and please do have a peek at the website and accompanying materials because there's plenty there. We're living in extraordinary times, really, and it requires an extraordinary response. The climate we know is accelerating and we can witness it all around, including typhoons in the Philippines, bushfires in Australia and California. We know it's impacting on health and is finally recognized as a health crisis. And yet at the same time, we're amidst another health crisis, the pandemic, which is really also very closely linked in our relationship with the environment. COVID has hit the world hard and there's so much to learn from it. Every country is grappling with the best ways to respond to this, be it the impact on overly stretched services, the gaping inequity which has been brought into sharp focus, the impact on the environment, indeed higher consumption of plastics and personal protective equipment have really stretched our global procurement me mechanisms. And now the vaccine distribution is showing even further inequities, a real inequity crisis too. This is a real systems issue through and through. And so as we work to recover and be better prepared for future waves and pandemics, we must take the opportunity to integrate the best of what we know about equity, prevention, preparedness and climate smart healthcare so we can chart a course to zero emissions, linking in resilience and our global health goals. Our opportunity, or maybe I should say our duty, is not only to build forward better, but to transform our health systems to ensure we can ju be just prepared, resilient and zero emissions. I'm sure David Nabara and Maria Nera will be able to describe it poignantly. So it's a double challenge, and luckily we have some common solutions. In September 2019, we published a green paper that highlighted the size of the issue the global health sector footprint is 4.4% of the global emissions. It's equivalent to a sizable country, and if it were a country, would be number fifth on that list. It's not surprising, given the diversity of healthcare and the resources that are needed. Identifying the size of the issue, though, is one thing. The next task is to identify how to get to zero emissions so we can start to make it happen. How do we navigate this much needed systems transformation? So the purpose of the roadmap is to get us moving on that journey. Many have started and we all need to accelerate action now. So I'm gonna hand over to Josh to describe that further. Thank you, Sonia. So given the finding in Green Paper One that healthcare is a major climate polluter, a finding that has since been corroborated by a number of national and international academic studies, we made a recommendation in 2019 
that the healthcare sector should decarbonize and seek to align with the ambition of the Paris Agreement, while simultaneously deploying climate smart strategies to achieve resilience and meet global health goals such as universal health coverage. To do so, we suggest that a global framework for systems change be created for a sector that makes up about 10% of the world economy. That's no small task. We've spent the last year, as Gary mentioned, working on it, thanks to the support from both the Skoll Foundation and the IKEA Foundation. So we are really pleased today to share with you Green Paper 2, the global roadmap for healthcare decarbonization. It is the first ever attempt to chart a course to zero emissions for the health sector. It is intended to be a navigational tool for achieving decarbonization with climate resilience and health equity. It is a collaboration with the global consulting firm Arup, who did all of the technical modeling and projections, merging global health and climate data. Its development was guided, as Gary mentioned, by a prestigious advisory group of health and climate leaders from around the world, some of whom are joining us later in this session. The roadmap identifies how healthcare decarbonization, resilience, and pandemic preparedness can be mutually reinforcing and synergistic. It projects trends into the future and identifies key pathways forward. Its main message is threefold. First, the health sector needs to exert its leadership to take on the climate crisis, which presents a series of health threats that together could make the current pandemic pale in comparison. Second, healthcare can and must chart a course to zero emissions in an unequal world, where some hospitals and health systems are huge climate polluters and others don't have access to electricity. And many people don't have access to care at all. Healthcare decarbonization must contribute to achieving both greater health equity and climate justice. Third, to get there requires a major transformation of the sector, transformation in how health is financed and delivered, transformation of how healthcare goods and services are manufactured, packaged, transported, and disposed of, transformation of the broader society's production consum and consumption of energy and food and more. <laughs> So the roadmap contains fact sheets for 68 nations with data on their healthcare carbon footprint. These fact sheets are designed to serve as tools for our partners in our global network, as well as healthcare and climate advocates everywhere to engage policymakers and healthcare leaders to take action. All of this, the roadmap, the country fact sheets, an in-depth technical report on methodology, a series of recommended interventions for climate smart healthcare, and a set of charts and graphics is available in a dynamic online report with downloadable PDFs. It will soon be available in Spanish and then other languages. You can find it at healthcareclimateaction.org. The roadmap is arriving in the time of COVID. It is a time where we have all become increasingly aware of the interrelationship between climate change and human health. It is a time who, where those dedicated to climate are recognizing the centrality of health in their endeavors. It is also a time where despite the immense pressures of the pandemic, a growing number of health systems and organizations around the world are taking on the climate crisis. So a few quick examples. In England, the National Health Service this year during the pandemic committed to and issued a plan to get to net zero emissions by 2047. In the United States, several major health systems have either achieved or are committed to carbon neutrality and are moving toward net zero emissions. The US National Academy of Medicine is launching a climate and health grand challenge. In Argentina, the national government as part of its nationally determined contribution to the Paris Agreement has committed to measuring and reducing its healthcare sector's climate footprint. And in India, the state of Chhattisgarh is implementing a plan to run all of its more than 900 health centers on renewable energy something that will build climate resilience, move the system towards zero emissions, and increase people's access to health services in one of the poorest states of India. We will also hear today from Healthcare Without Harm's partners at the World Health Organization, the United Nations Development Program, and the Public Health Foundation of India, and the UK government, which holds the presidency of COP26 on their healthcare climate action initiatives. This is a brief and incomplete snapshot of the context of healthcare climate momentum in which the roadmap is arriving. And we still have a steep hill to climb. So here's a, a look at what that hill is. The roadmap's point of departure is the two gigatons of greenhouse gas emissions in 2014. That's 4.4% of net global emissions. We were able to project through the modeling that we did 
that if we continue with business as usual, by 2050, healthcare's climate footprint will triple, reaching six gigatons per year. That obviously is unacceptable. We were also able to model that if governments were actually able to meet the commitments they made up until 2017 via the Paris Agreement, that 70% of those emissions uh, of, the, of that growth would be reduced. So, but you can see on this graph, there's still a big gap there. In fact, healthcare's emissions would continue to grow significantly over that time period. So we also began to model through a series of three pathways and interconnected with seven high impact actions that Sonia will talk about in a minute, um, how the sector can significantly reduce and move towards zero emissions. But even with those pathways and actions, there's still a gap. And that's something that we're calling uncharted territory. And there are a series of different actions that we've begun to develop and identify where healthcare could take to move fully towards zero emissions, again, while achieving greater climate resilience and greater health equity. So that is a snapshot of the roadmap, which we're going to detail for you in a little bit uh, in, in a minute. One of the other findings of the roadmap process is that fossil fuel combustion is the dominant source of healthcare emissions, contributing to 84% of those emissions across healthcare delivery and operations, across the supply chain, and in the infrastructure of the broader society that underpins our healthcare systems. So, and, and that comes from energy, it comes from the production of plastics, it comes from the production of pharmaceuticals, from agricultural production to serve food in hospitals across the board. And so one of the conclusions is healthcare needs to advocate both within its own system as well as outside the hospital walls for a transition to clean, renewable, healthy energy. I'm gonna pass it on to Sonia to talk about how we can get there and how we can chart a course to zero. Thank you. So the roadmap really aims to set a vision and a strategy for the sector to get to zero emissions. It's a fundamental system transformation, as we've mentioned before. And a lot of it is already happening in different places, but it really needs acceleration and disruption and innovative solutions to make that happen. We know some of the elements of what this might look like. So, you know, delivering energy, for instance, empowering clinics with solar energy in areas where the national grid is unstable or non-existent, solar refrigeration to keep COVID vaccines and other essential medicines cold, switching anaesthetic gases to safer ones that have a significantly reduced potency, influencing or disrupting healthcare purchasing to move away from disposable and toxic plastics, and developing models of care that are green, fit for the future, and deliver high quality outcomes, a real One Health approach. Of course, everyone has a part to play, from health professionals prescribing medicines and making daily choices about the products that are used, engineers making best use of renewable and energy efficient technology, health decision makers can put in place policies and financing to facilitate the implementation and use their reach to focus on more sustainable models of care. And of course, all of us as patients or people concerned with sustainability and health by making sure our voice is heard. So governments have committed to their own contributions, both North and South, and we recognize that everyone is at a different starting place. This is a fundamental global and local equity issue. Clearly, those countries and communities whose health sector is most responsible for the problem need to take the greatest responsibility in addressing it. And we also know that emissions might need to grow in some low and middle income countries to help achieve universal access to healthcare, as we must ensure greater health, greater health equity during this transformation. So this roadmap proposes four trajectories. They're all based on countries' GDP as a marker for the starting points and you'll see that everybody needs to reach zero anyway. And they are, it's quite possible to set interim targets along the way to help drive that impetus. So in short, this profound transformation needs to happen whilst also addressing equity and other related health priorities. And it's our opportunity or duty to stand up and play our part. So this next piece that I'm gonna to talk to you about is really the, the three pathways and it's the heart of the roadmap. You will find a lot more information described in the document and the annexes. So the roadmap highlights three pathways and the three pathways are below this blue wedge, which is the nationally determined contributions. So we're assuming for a moment that all of those have been achieved. 
and the things I'm going to describe to you are over and above. So the first pathway is what the health sector needs to do with its own operations and facilities, for instance, through clinical practice, the way buildings are used or segregating waste. The second is what the supply chain can do by making sure healthcare products are zero carbon. And the third is making sure that the wider economy and society match the same pace of reductions through agriculture, energy, transport, and all of the other infrastructure that influence the health sector. And the health sector can make sure this happens by advocating for it. They don't all follow the scopes of greenhouse gases because what we're trying to focus on in these pathways is who needs to take action. So I'm gonna to talk to you now about the seven um, high impact actions, which takes the same wedge and describes these further. They all, these seven actions contribute to the three pathways that I've just described. And overall, these seven actions would contribute 44.8 gigatons by 2050. Now I know you might say, what on earth does that mean? But it is equivalent to one year of global emissions. So these seven impact actions have been modeled with the data that's available. It's no doubt or under underestimate. And if we can deepen some of these actions, we could go further. I'll highlight one or two in more detail just to give you a flavor. So renewables is the first one, and we've mentioned this already as a cornerstone of the wider energy transition um, about how, and how we bring access to some parts and change the type of energy that people use. The second one is buildings, and this would contribute 17.8 gigatons. This is the same as all of the US and China emissions in a year may be worth highlighting as John Kerry, as US Special Envoy, is visiting China today. Developing zero emissions buildings that are fit for purpose for the healthcare in 21st century is a cornerstone action in the way buildings are used and designed, the way they are built and the materials are used, and also the infrastructure they rely on. Many are doing this, so the NHS is committed to making sure their 40 new hospitals are net zero. And hospitals in Latin America are considering how to achieve effective and sustainable cooling through natural ventilation and less potent refrigerants. Of course, we mustn't forget building refurbishments as they too are key. Most buildings that are going to be in place in 2050 are already built. Travel is absolutely crucial. We need to think of active and sustainable travel as well as electrification. Food that is local, sustainable and plant forward can ensure a contribution of close to one gigaton. That's equivalent to two countries like France and Germany's contribution in a year. Pharmaceuticals, 2.9 gigatons, that would be similar to Russia and India in a year, is one is a specific health intervention. The way medicines are prescribed, and the way we move towards greener pharmaceuticals and the infrastructure that supports the manufacture, dissemination and waste management of these products. So we really need to develop lower impact medicines and look at the way we prescribe um, different medicines and every health professional and the entire health industry has got a role to play in that. Inhaler propellants and anesthetic gases have been highlighted as a hotspot. Um, and that's because not only do, are there alternatives that are less impactful, but also there's clinically safe ways of doing so. And that's likely to apply to many more medicines and medical products. So we must choose to try and make zero carbon and sustainability a central thread. Um, clearly, as a society, when we consider the way we use and dispose of medicines and their packaging, including COVID waste vaccine and PPE, personal protective equipment, we need to try and make sure that it is done equitably, zero carbon, sustainably. And so, of course, we need to pay attention to all the products that are purchased. And so we, we've got so many medical products that are single use. There's something about trying to work towards more reprocessable or designed for reuse products. So we can also manage waste sustainably. sustainably. Clearly, this responsibility lies in several parts. The way healthcare uses them, for instance, there's lots of things that can be autoclaved rather than incinerated. Gloves can be um, used for, don't need, are not needed for all procedures, for instance, to administer a vaccine or to push a wheelchair. So paying attention to 
the way we utilize products and the way they're manufactured could actually contribute a huge amount. That would be twice the size of the EU contributions in a year. And the last one on here is about effectiveness. And this is making sure that the money that's spent on healthcare actually goes to addressing the right healthcare goals so everyone can benefit. This is particularly recognizable in some very high spend countries such as the US. And that would contribute another half dozen countries to the scheme like Canada, Mexico, France, and Korea. Now I've gone through these rather rapidly, but the sad story about it is that even through all these actions, we still don't get to net zero and we would need to um, dig further and explore the transformation even further. We are all signed up to making sure that we globally achieve universal access to healthcare. So making sure that the way we do that is fundamentally green is key. This would mean it is fully powered by renewables, built for resilience, using natural cooling and rainwater recovery, that we have sustainable waste management, that we maximize the opportunities of telehealth so we can be less building focused and supportive of primary care, local communities, and fundamentally health promoting. I'm sure Dr. Reddy can hi help highlight that um, further later on. It means that healthcare needs to focus on prevention. And as part of this work, we um, undertook an interesting exercise looking at what the reduction of tobacco consumption, meat consumption, air pollution, and obesity could contribute not only to better health, but also to less emissions. And it's significant. It's similar, and my country's analogy to Japan and more, on top of the impacts that this would derive through changes in agriculture. So this needs to be considered as a serious climate inter intervention as well as being a health intervention. Healthy people, like um, Gary said, help drive a healthy planet and a healthy planet helps ensure healthy people. It's a real win-win. This means really that we need to orientate green health financing in a number of ways to transform the health sector, making sure that it's available to catalyze climate smart healthcare at every level, to power last mile clinics, make a shift to renewables, incentivize climate smart innovation, foster a green and healthy recovery. And eventually, I really hope that it'll help us shift to business models to incentivize healthy, sustainable outcomes for all, rather than focusing on activity or products. So as I hand over to Josh, I hope we can count on you all to play your part on this healing journey. I'm certainly in, I hope you are too. Thank you, Sonia. So to decarbonize, as Sonia mentioned, every part of the health sector must follow a trajectory to zero emissions. There must be transformation and there must be innovation. There must be investment and there must be cross-sectoral collaboration. In this regard, the roadmap provides a set of recommendations for governments, international agencies, the private sector and civil society. It calls on governments to create national roadmaps, action plans, regulations and legislation for decarbonization. It calls on bilateral aid and international agencies to invest in climate smart healthcare as part of their COVID recovery spending, their climate finance, and their health development packages. It calls on private health systems, suppliers, and manufacturers to all join the race to zero emissions. And it calls on doctors, nurses, and health workers of all stripes to raise their voices for a transformation of their workplaces, their sector, and our broader societies. Hospitals and health systems everywhere are already taking action for climate smart health care. We'll hear in the next panel um, about how uh, the UK government is working as the presidency of COP26 to encourage uh, other nations to uh, follow in the footsteps of the National Health Service. And we're seeing governments in different parts of the world already starting to make some commitments to address their climate footprint in health care. Health care without harm will also be releasing a series of tools and resources to empower the health sector to measure, reduce, and track their emissions as we move along the road to zero. And I'm also very um, proud to announce that the UNFCCC has partnered with Healthcare Without Harm to establish a healthcare component of their Race to Zero campaign, a global initiative to rally leadership and support from non-state actors for a healthy, resilient, zero carbon recovery that prevents future threats, creates decent jobs, and unlocks inclusive, sustainable growth. At the end of May, during the World Health Assembly, we will be announcing the first cohort of, of health systems representing thousands of hospitals from every continent committed to zero emissions. We expect more and more health systems to join this effort in the lead up to COP26 in November and beyond. So 
as I mentioned at the outset, the roadmap is designed to be the North Star, or the, if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, the Southern Cross to navigate, uh, for the health sector to navigate for transformational systems change. It underscores that it is imperative that the health sector seize this moment and provide climate, the climate leadership the world so desperately needs. While there is no vaccine for the climate crisis, prevention and preparedness, two fundamental healthcare principles are what could help save the day and deliver healthy people on a healthy planet. Thank you very much and back over to you, Gary. Thanks so much, Josh and Sonia. Uh, at this point, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Mandeep Dhaliwal. Uh, who is the director of HIV development and health at the United Nations Development Program. Mandeep sits at the intersection of climate and health and development, um, and so has incredible wisdom and, and assets to bring to this ecosystem change. And she's going to introduce the, the panel that's responding to the roadmap. Mandeep. Wonderful, thank you, Gary, and um, and it's uh, it's an honor to be here today with so many leaders on health and climate. Um, UNDP is supporting 118 countries to make more ambitious climate promises and take more ambitious climate action, and we're delighted to be uh, part of this panel because we think that the health sector has an important role to play, um, and this roadmap is exactly the kind of practical tool that can help really lift the climate ambition of the health sector. I'm really pleased to be moderating a panel with two health leaders who are also climate leaders, um, Charlotte Watts and, um, and Professor Reddy. So I'm gonna start with Charlotte because I know Charlotte has to leave, she's got a hard stop at the top of the hour. So Charlotte, could you tell us a little bit more about what the UK is doing uh, to support low carbon health systems uh, and that whole agenda as part of its COP26 presidency and to, to really walk the talk, as they say. Uh, great. Thank you, Mandeep. Uh, and thank you, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here to represent FCD on, on, at this event. Um, we were keen to be here because we really recon recognize that climate change represents a major challenge for public health and is a key driver of health inequalities. You know, we know the most disadvantaged are, are also the most vulnerable to poor health outcomes from climate change. They'll have the least ability to adapt or respond. Um, you know, we're already seeing that COVID is leading to significant reversals in increases in extreme poverty and reversals of development gains. And we know that climate change is going to further undermine those hard worn progress and development. Um, we're very interested in seeing health systems as important um, because we know they're going to be vulnerable. They are going to be at the front of trying to respond to the impacts of climate change, just as they've been at the front of responding to COVID. Um, and we recognize also that health systems are important contributors to health emissions. Um, you know, the four to five percent figure that we've just heard about is really an important reality check of how significant. And to me, just seeing those projections about over time, how this might increase is also quite startling because clearly we really want to invest in health systems. We really do want to strengthen them, but we need to figure out how to do that in a way um, that is clean and that doesn't lead to increased uh, emissions um, as we move forward. Um, I think, you know, I've worked in health for a long time um, on issues of inequality, on issues of gender. Um, and I think a lot of the same thinking applies here. You know, the health sector has a role both in terms of looking at its own activity, but the voice of health experts, of health, bringing health expertise into these conversations is really critical. It's a powerful voice, it's a technical voice, and we fundamentally have that framing of thinking about prevention as well as action, which is so central um, when we think about um, the breadth of the issues that we need to, to address and, and, and the breadth of the agendas that the health at the roadmap talks about. Um, because of the importance of the issue um, and as part of COP, the UK has chosen health and climate as a priority. And so it will be a focus of activity as part of our COP agenda um, and we will be um, 
at Glasgow before that and after that very much working to, uh, to seek commitments um, which put health country uh, country health systems uh, make commitments for for resilient health systems um, and 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 trying to really get commitment and sign up to low low carbon future pathways so this is an important for agenda for us and one that we will bring attention to as part of our COP presidency. Um, as was mentioned previously, and I feel very proud about, is that the UK health system, our NHS, is already showing strong leadership on emission reduction and air quality improvement. Um, and it set itself ambitious targets um, to bring down health sector emissions um, uh, and, and, and looking particularly at the emissions that are under that control um, with targets to reach net zero by 2040. And this is the first health sector in the world to make such a commitment and uh, one that I know there's a lot of work behind the scenes to, to move us forward um, towards achieving that achieve, achievement. Um, just thinking about the agenda ahead, it's very clear that any ambitions for health sector decarbonisation must recognise that both within and between countries, health systems are at very different points of development. Um, and so in that climate smart agenda, we need to consider and address the real challenges of achieving this and think about the different starting points um, uh, of different countries and of different systems and, and how we do this, recognizing the resource constraints. We need to continue to be able to provide effective healthcare, but we need to be really thinking about how we do that in a way that is clean. Um, I think when we're thinking about that pathway to sustainable health system, there's some really important opportunities to um, support health systems that may not have had access to reliable energy sources previously to leap to leapfrog uh, fossil fuels and to really invest in how do we draw on the many innovations that we're seeing um, to increase access to clean energy or increase access in some cases to any energy at at all a reliable energy resource as part of the health service provision. And as part of my own, uh, our FCDO's own uh, investments in R&D, we are, for example, supporting a range of innovations to try and expand clean energy access to very remote off-grid uh, rural um, settings, and also investing in other innovations, so, uh, such as low-cost uh, solar fridges, and also piloting a range of um, low cost uh, cook stove initiatives, for example. So really trying to think about what are the breadth of technologies that we will need in future and how do we make them clean? Um, as Gary, Josh and Sonia have made clear, you know, the concept behind this is, is really simple, but actually the pathway is very, very complex and there's multiple facets to that. And so we see the roadmap as being very critical to help us unpick the breadth of the challenges and to help countries to navigate that journey, journey to sustainable low carbon. Um, I'm really pleased also to see the commitment to equity as part of that, including on issues of gender. Um, and ultimately, um, this roadmap highlights the opportunity that we all have if we work together um, to build climate resilient, sustainable and low, low carbon health systems. And this will not only help us achieve the climate targets that we're all setting ourselves, but also we hope will uh, support our ambitions also to achieve universal health coverage. So with that, I'll finish, but uh, thank you very much. And I look forward to the discussions ahead. Thanks so much, Charlotte. And I think really uh, something which resonates strongly with, uh, with UNDP is the, the linking to equity. Um, and the linking to you know, climate resilient health systems and really recognizing that health systems are all very different. Um, so now let's, let's go to uh, Professor Reddy, um, who uh, leads the Public Health Foundation in India to give us a perspective from India. What, what do you see as the really, um, what are the opportunities and the transformational power of, of such a roadmap from the context of um, the Indian health system. Over to you, Professor Reddy. I think I'll uh, start off with uh, where the last uh, comment ended, which is on how this can very well fit into the agenda of universal health coverage. Mm -hmm. And indeed, when we look at that, the kind of conflict that seems to arise between countries who are at a different level of emissions and who are wondering what kind of goals are being set for them 
to be achieved by 2050 and whether there are different starting points, both of their economic development and also in terms of their carbon emissions. I think all of that can be substantially resolved when we look at common but differentiated responsibilities, but in the context of the advancement towards universal health coverage and sustainable development goals, uh, the targets. Indeed, a country like India, which has to invest a lot more in expanding its healthcare facilities across the country in order to meet uh, the demands that are still unaddressed and particularly of a growing population with a demographic shift towards non, uh, an aging population with non-communicable diseases becoming very prominent. So there is a transformation that's required in India's health system in terms of the nature of services provided and the ability of an expanded health care facility, as well as a larger health workforce uh, to meet those challenges. And therefore, as we do that, as we advance towards strengthening our health system, particularly through a primary health care focused universal health coverage platform, then there is a great opportunity to adopt greener technologies. The moment we start strengthening primary health care, both in urban and rural areas, we are bringing healthcare closer to home with far less intensive investment in high technology and high cost advanced care institutions. It is not only good for health because you're prioritizing prevention and early care closer to home or at home and lesser dependence on costly care at high tech intensive advanced care institutions. And therefore, that itself is going to have a high impact on uh, the kind of energy utilization and is going to be definitely helpful for decarbonization. And I think that is a path that we'll have to really differentiate for different countries, as has already been mentioned. High income countries who have already fairly advanced healthcare systems, which are intensive emitters and energy users, ought to reform and reverse they have to adapt new systems. Now, basically, as far as the middle income countries are concerned, they have to hold where they are in terms of their expansion. And as they move further on, they have to move much more to greener technologies. But for countries like India, which at the moment are not high emitters, we do need to ensure that we have an opportunity to build up our healthcare system on a much greater, uh, with a much greater emphasis on greener technologies. And I think that's a great opportunity anyway, that particularly uh, a primary healthcare led universal health coverage provides. Of course, as has been stated already, there is a great opportunity for our healthcare system to play a role also in transforming the thinking across both policymakers as well as the public. We have established a health and environment leadership platform consisting of several hospitals across India, several healthcare facilities, both in the public and private sector, where the thinking is now going on as to how these institutions can actually adopt greener technologies and ensure that overall utilization of energy will come down, the emissions will come down, at the same time, they're also becoming powerful advocates for policy change. They're becoming important communicators, trusted communicators to the public, trying to bring about a greater change in thinking. And the communication with policymakers is very important in countries like India, where frequently when there are international calls for reducing emissions, saying that there are high levels of absolute emissions, the usual defensive posture of countries is to go back and say, but our per capita emissions are low and we don't need to really do much about it mm. for quite some time. On the other hand, if we actually start informing both the policymakers and the public that irrespective of the level of per capita emissions, our vulnerability to global climate change is going to make us among the prime victims of the health consequences of, global, of climate change. 
And therefore, we have every, uh, it, it's in our interest in order to influence the global debate. And from taking a, from a defensive posture, we must take an assertive position to advance the climate change agenda. And what better to do that than to actually position ourselves also as very visible and valuable agents of change. So that is the argument we are putting forth to our policymakers, we are putting forth to our media, and we are trying to ensure that the public opinion crystallizes in favor of concrete actions which can advance the, uh, the agenda of uh, decarbonization. And I believe, of course, as we are modifying our health system, expanding it, our purchasing power of the healthcare system, which can extend into multiple areas of supply, can also be a very important uh, catalyst for a cascade of change across several institutions and that that itself can be transformational. Thank you so much, Professor Reddy. And I think just to summarize some of the key things that we've heard from both panelists, I think the importance of leadership leading by example, um, having ambition, being proactive, um, and not taking a defensive posture, I think is very important. I think the transformation to healthy and sustainable and really the, the synergy between the two um, is critical. And, and you've uh, both highlighted, I think, something that's quite powerful, which is using the universal health coverage public or primary health care framing to use some of these high impact actions that have been identified in the roadmap, like clean energy um, and green technologies, health technologies as a way to really drive, drive action. Um, and I think really that underlines for me one of the key messages from the roadmap, which is that this is indeed feasible. We have the practical guidance to do it. Um, we have, uh, you know, we have islands of, uh, of good practice um, and ambition and sufficient ambition to do this. Um, I think it's really uh, a call to action for us to more systematically look at how we can uh, make health systems health sector um, lead by example in terms of uh, climate ambition and, cli and ambitious climate action. I think we've heard two very important perspectives, um, you know, and the leadership from the UK government, especially going into the COP is, is really, really important. Um, I think the perspectives from, uh, from countries where universal health coverage and primary health care can be critical vehicles for advancing um, uh, green uh, uh, green health systems is, is also really, really important. So with that, Gary, I just want to, I'll hand over to you and just to uh, thank the panel for, um, I think some very thoughtful um, and practical insights and, um, and over to you for the next panel. Thanks very thanks much. very Mandeep. much to both panelists. Thanks very much, Mandeep. Thanks, Renath. Thanks, Charlotte, for joining us and offering your thoughts today. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, Part of the strategy is to educate and mobilize health professionals and workers as messengers and advocates for climate solutions. So especially engaging the next generation of healthcare workers is crucial because they're growing up in the age of climate change. They understand what's at stakes very clearly. There's amazing energy and passion and creativity that's bubbling up from this next generation of, of doctors and nurses and healthcare workers to raise the alarm and join the fight. So we'd like to share a two minute video with you from some of our India partners, including the Indian Medical Students Association, the Doctors for Clean Air, the Lung Care Foundation of India and Healthy Energy Initiative. Let's roll the film. Denai city confronting its worst crisis after the heaviest rainfall in our hundred Every two minutes, years. one person dies due to air pollution in this country. It's Tamil Nadu's worst drought in a hundred years. Till now, 324 years. people are dead. All four lakes around the city are dry. Delhi is a virtual gas chain. Let's take you straight to the breaking news coming in at this hour. The glacial burst in Uttarakhand, the Chamoli district. Despite all we see around us, we still look at climate change as a far-fetched environmental issue and not a health issue. Just like COVID-19, climate change is fueling a crisis that will threaten every person, every nation, and every continent and we'll leave no one untouched. A lot of us still continue to remain unaware. 
Surprisingly, even medical curriculums don't effectively cover the extent and impact of climate change on our health and well-being. It's the worst day of pollution in Delhi and the national capital region. It's not even Diwali, that's two days away. Now, the PM 2.5 levels hit between 800 and 900 across parts of Delhi. Air pollution is the new tobacco and is a leading environmental factor causing premature deaths, leading to more than 6 million deaths each year. That's more deaths than those caused by AIDS, malaria and TB combined. Other than that, natural calamities like floods not only cause widespread property damage, but have also started to cause an increased number of disease outbreaks across the country and the world. Even though time is short, all isn't lost yet. There's a lot we can do if we start acting now, be it by educating ourselves or those around us, or taking positive action such as switching to renewable energy or saying no to plastic or opting for public transport or by holding lawmakers and decision makers accountable for our health and for that of our planets. There's a lot we can do and we need to do right now. As healthcare professionals, we take oath to protect our patients, identify our responsibility and actively work towards achieving carbon neutrality, exercise our democratic right to demand a system shift to combat climate change. Time for collective action is now. So uh, in the last panel, I'm so honored to invite uh, David Nabara, who's the WHO Special Envoy on, Con on COVID-19 and formerly the Special Envoy on the Climate Change to join us, as well as Maria Nera, who's the Director of the Development uh, of uh, Environment, Climate and Health at the WHO and has been a partner with us for the last decade or more. Um, thanks and uh, welcome to the Skull Forum, both of you. Thank you, Gabby. Nice to be here. Hi. Hello. Great, great to have you. So I, I want to start by asking both of you, because you're both sitting at this, at this crucial intersection between COVID and the climate crisis. And uh, let's start with, with you both. But to, what are some of the most important steps we need to take to support health systems around the world to take on the climate challenge, even as they struggle to address the COVID crisis and the other pressures they face? How do we, how do we bridge these things? Uh, it's been discussed, but what are your perspectives? Maria and then David? Do you want me to start? Please. Okay, with pleasure. Hi, David, how are you? Very nice to see you. Gary and all the participants, uh, it has been really very, very nice to, to hear about these plans, about this roadmap, to realize that it's something, as Mandeep was saying, something that we can do, something feasible, something concrete. And I think, Gary, that this is exactly the type of uh, message we need at the moment. People feel very vulnerable, very fragile. We have all been exposed to something absolutely dramatic that is causing incredible consequences. So probably the last word they want to hear is uh, there will be another crisis. There will be yet another big problem. So we need to make sure that we put our messages in positive. And here is a, is a very positive message. We need to recover for, from COVID-19 and we need to do it on a healthy and green way. And of course, on a fair way as well. But uh, in WHO's manifesto, when we did that already in May last year, understanding that of course you need to fight COVID-19 and you need to be uh, the best uh, firefighter and stop the transmission and the consequences. But at the same time, you need to do an analysis and look at why are we here? What has been causing all of this damage and why we reached this point? Why are we so vulnerable as human beings? And part of the answer is because we have been destroying the ecosystems. We have been doing a, a, a deforestation in a very massive way. We have been going against the biodiversity. 
We have been trading and commercializing wild animals. Uh, we have been doing a very aggressive agricultural practices. And of course, all of that mm -hmm. has contributed to, 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 to break that barrier between the, the oh, yes. and the human health. So now oh, yes. the, the positive message is that by tackling the causes of climate change, you will be contributing to the recovery of uh, COVID-19 on a sustainable way. And you will be addressing the causes of climate change which are very much overlapping no, causes of air pollution. Mm -hmm. And therefore you can contribute to the seven million premature deaths caused by exposure to air pollution. You can contribute to reduce the, the horrible negative economic impact that we have created. And we can mobilize the people around something more action oriented, more positive, more engaging, more motivating. And on this, I think that the, the, the health sector has to play an enormous role. I think we need to not only present the arguments, put the, the, the arguments on the table, explain how much health is at risk now and how much we can do to, to reduce our vulnerability, not to, to reach a zero risk, of course, but to reduce our vulnerability on a smart way means you know, stopping our fight with nature and the environment, which is a ridiculous one. You cannot destroy the nature, which is the one giving you food, water, and, and the air we breathe, and we are destroying it, polluting everything we touch. Actually, everything we touch is polluted. Um, I, I, I Sometimes I feel a little bit um, strange when people say, uh, we need to save the planet. No, we need to save ourselves because what we are doing might destroy a little bit the planet, but it will destroy us completely. So we, we, we need to, to adjust to those uh, structural failures that uh, we have been able to identify now during the COVID. And I think that now the, the, the green road, the healthy road, the motivating road, and the, the, the leadership of the health sector will be fundamental. So I'm very much for this uh, healthy and green movement where the, the, the health sector will lead and where a roadmap like uh, the one you have presented today on decarbonizing the, the, the health sector, I think it will be very positive, engaging, motivating, and giving something very concrete that you can take and, and, and be proud of and, and, and gives you even more motivation for more. So just a, uh, some thoughts that I'm sure that David will have. A, this is my green thing. So, and uh, how we need to put green walls David, to protect and to make us less vulnerable. Do you think it's the right color for our discussion today? Yeah, I do. Maria, I, I mean, first of all, uh, if it's okay just to pick up from where Maria has left us. I mean, so inspiring. And uh, here is a, a, a senior public health doctor making it clear to us that for her, she perceives that the future of public health has to be planted in and growing out of a really integrated approach to what health means and that we have to take account of the interactions between different forces in society in order to find a pathway through. And so, yes, I'm gonna pick up. You see, Maria has been very clear from herself and her team, it's abundantly evident what needs to be done. And I think there's increasing clarity on how it's got to be done. And for me, the next stage is to move from the what and the how to the me. Where do I fit in? Now, I could be anybody. But as Maria pointed out, unless the decisions that are made in relation to what happens to people's health linked to climate and linked to other stresses like COVID and so on. Unless we can make it relevant to me and to us, it's super difficult to get any progress. And so my own efforts, Gary, in the last couple of years have been very much about trying to ensure that the issues around climate change and health are not seen all the time as somebody else's problem, for somebody else to solve, but that actually 
They are our problem for us to solve. Any one of us who's concerned about health has got to internalize this and start working with it as a personal issue. So last year with Maria and with uh, a group of others, we established an advisory panel to think about the health impacts of climate change that produced a report that was then presented at the World Innovation Summit for Health. It took place virtually. Normally it takes place in the Gulf. And that report titled Health Impacts of the Climate Crisis looked at the what, looked at the how, but then shifted to the me. And I think I want to stress to everybody that I think this approach of bringing things back to us and asking ourselves what is our role and what should we be ready to be called to account for when we are performing that role is now more important than ever. So reaching you know, the end of this part, Gary, climate, climate change is our problem. As health workers, it's our problem because of the extraordinary impacts, the health impacts of climate change uh, and we are also, it's our problem because of the damage that climate change can do to health systems. And so it is essential that we find ways to help people who work in health in any role, not just care providers, but people who finance health, people who supply in health, people who measure health, and people who support health professionals. All of us, I think, could do well to start recognizing the climate change is not out there. It's something that's for us. So I'm right where Maria is. And in order to try to give that some kind of extra relevance, my colleagues and I have been working on an index card of things that all health professionals ought to be thinking about doing. Five things that are personal actions about me and how I live. Again, picking up on what Maria says, but five things that relate to my position in society as a responsible person, as we saw in that Indian video, the colleagues saying, we took an oath, so we're gonna act. So we believe there are five other things, besides things that we do in our own lives, there are five things that we must apply every time we're meeting with others, especially if we're in a responsible position, to bring climate change into our daily business, alongside the other issues that we know as public health professionals matter to us. Thank you so much, both of you for your comments. And I have a follow-up question because you're talking about sort of internalizing responsibility internal and bringing it home to you. And I think one of the greatest obstacles we've had from moving away from fossil fuels is that the harm that it has caused has been externalized onto society. Uh, the WHO has reported that millions of people die each year from air pollution, um, and most of it from the combustion of fossil fuels. Uh, the damage from climate-related disasters continues to grow each year. Uh, there's ever-increasing numbers of climate refugees that are fleeing their country, and yet the fossil fuel companies aren't paying for this damage. We are. Society is. So there's still no price on carbon that reflects its true cause. The International Monetary Fund did a study a couple of years ago that said the direct and indirect subsidies to, to that industry is $5 trillion a year. That's almost more than all of the healthcare expenditure of every government on the planet. So the roadmap is crucial and it's a path forward, but it seems that we also need to figure out how to, how to get the cost, the true cost of the fossil fuel economy to be internalized because it's fueling the greatest public health threat that we face on the planet. How, how can we take that step? That seems so critical to internalize those costs. What are your thoughts? Uh, if, I, if I may, uh, David, you allow me to start. I, I leave the important part for you. I will start. No, with no. You. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. <laughs> it's such a pleasure. Um, a few months ago, I remember discussing with a journalist and he was asking me something similar, who is paying for, for the cost of fossil fuels? And, and I answered it on a very simple way. And then he put that on a headline and say, 
the cost of the fossil fuels is paid by our lungs. I mean, I, I think this is what we need to visualize. That is what people need to visualize, that uh, the, the real cost of burning fast fossil fuels is paid by my health. Maybe not just to the lungs, it's the lungs and many other organs of our body. But this is the first thing that we need to make sure that the people, that the citizens, the individuals, as David was saying, uh, they understand the connection. And one very important way to make that connection is um, the issue of air pollution. People have difficulties on visualizing how climate change will affect them directly. You know, we explain it and we talk about uh, the horrible impact that uh, the negative that climate change will have on your health. But unless you visualize it, people have some difficulties. But when you tell them about air pollution causing asthma, for instance, which is not a direct thing, but still uh, exacerbate asthma case and mortality, people make the connection and then they realize that this is something that will affect me my son, my nephew, somebody that is very close to me, the little Ella who lost her life because she was exposed very often to, to very high levels of air pollution. And then we, we can make an incredible advocacy movement there because people make the connection. Now, the, the fossil fuels, WHO made a very strong statement a little bit beyond our comfort zone in our manifesto, the, the, the prescription number six says, a stop paying subsidies to fossil fuels. That was a little bit uh, provocative for an agency like WHO, but we are very much convinced. A stop giving subsidies for, to fossil fuel because the 400 billions that are now going to the uh, subsidies, the cost, the real cost of that is paid by the health systems and it costs the five trillions, as you rightly say, Gary. Uh, Gary. So this is the type of arguments that we need very strong about it. And uh, it's, not, it's not, not only climate change, is air pollution. We bring these 7 million uh, premature deaths caused by air pollution to the table of the climate change. And this is where we need to be very serious about promoting renewable energy or clean sources of energy and telling the government this is a health argument. It's not just a, your business in terms of energy sources or how do you decide with your Ministry of Energy? No, 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 this is a health matter and we want to be part of, of the discussion on that. And uh, if they don't invite us, we invite ourselves. But now we have a big coalition on energy and health or health and energy. So through that, I think we can, uh, we can easily convince people or at least we will try to convince people the importance of the energy sources on, on protecting or not our health. Thank you, David. So I'd like to keep the style. Here's Maria, I think, correctly telling us that shifting the thinking and action in this space and helping the health community just become more and more engaged in issues to do with environmental uh, upsets, that can be done really well at the global level, and there's been an, ext an extraordinary shift. I mean, Maria mentioned the WHO manifesto. I'm sure everybody has read it, but if they haven't by any chance, or if they've forgotten it, I encourage them to go back and get it, and particularly to look at the beginning of that manifesto and see that this is a redefinition of public health through a lens of ecosystem services, and it's beautiful. I'm really impressed. So I want to say, okay, so we are redefining the public health paradigm and narrative. And in doing that, as well as identifying determinants of ill health in a new and sharpened way, there's also a real focus on appropriate responses. Maria's point about, you know, you've got to stop subsidizing these things that are killing people in large number. So you define the problem and you describe the solution. And then I'm going one stage further because of my emphasis on seeking to bring this to individuals and ensuring them to perceive that it is their responsibility to act. And that simply saying it's for somebody else does not work. So it comes to the whole 
process of how we help actors for health, wherever they might be, to see climate change and health as their problem and their need to act. Now, in order to do that, one of the first things we have to do is to put a figure on the cost of ill health associated with climate change. And, and that's always the starting point, and it's really beginning to happen in a good way. And the uh, roadmap we're discussing today has done just that. Secondly, we need to show how action now can reduce those costs. And so we have to put a cost on the action and its impact. And then we end up with clarity on the cost effectiveness of personal action for tackling the climate crisis through the actions of health people. We've done it before. I don't know whether colleagues remember, but, and I mean, Mandeep and I have worked on these issues before. You know, you have to start costing the determinants of ill health and their consequences in order to get ministries of finance to want to act. You have to start costing in order to get the financial controllers of health institutions to act. You have to start costing in order to really wake up the health insurance industry and get them to realize that this is something that hits the bottom line. So having a cost on this, but a really reasonable cost, not one that's inflated just to create headlines, but having a cost that can be validated is absolutely key. And so let's just conclude that in the end, this is about true cost, measuring true cost, and then actually arguing that the true cost can be reduced through action. And in doing that, we build a case and we also make ourselves feel more potent. Because instead of standing by and saying, whoops, climate change, very costly, can't touch it beyond my pay grade, we say, whoops, climate change, very costly, hurting my patients. I must act in because I am their advocate. I'm a public health doctor committed to equity or I'm a public health professional committed to equity. I must act on climate change. Otherwise, it's a dereliction of my duty. I uh, appreciate that. That's very powerful statements from both of you. I, I have one last question, but just the last couple of minutes we have is, um, in the early part of uh, the school forum, Lindsay Spindell asked the former president of Liberia and of Mexico, what gives you hope? So what gives you hope? You, you, both, you both are at a very high level seeing all of the forces at play at a global scale. What gives you hope? You're on the... I'm, 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 I'm psychologically optimistic, Gary. So <laughs> for me, hope is something that has to be around you know if not we will look look at the situation where we are now and we still need to have hope so imagine on on this climate change my hope comes from the fact that at the cop 26 i think we need to make something so strong and, and, and so clear and as you well know and, and david maybe you didn't hear it yet but we need your engagement as well we are prepared what we call the health argument for more climate action and we want uh, to be WHO lounge but we want as many associations and groups and relevant health professionals and others to co-sign with us and then go with a health argument say you need to do more on climate change mitigation because the health is at risk and because those will be the, the health benefits that you will be generating and because if not you will be guilty because you know with the air pollution we can even put a tag on that and saying, well, if you endorse WHO standards on air quality, you can save so many lives, so do it. And if not, I'm afraid you are not saving lives and therefore we can put it on a very negative way. So I think we need to, again, on a positive way, but there is hope and we need to move strongly and, and the health arg argument has to be the one driving this and not uh, the, anymore that the, the maybe the, the previous narrative that we were using that probably was not reaching the individual as David is, is convincing us to do it, that we need to reach the individual. 
And so our duet goes on. Thank you, Maria, for that uh, aria, because I so agree. And I, I mean, for me, the, the mood that Maria describes is becoming really exciting around the world. Of course, if you read the headlines of the newspaper, you could very easily go into your corner and imagine that there is no hope. But that's not what's really happening in our world today. There are communities of people coming together to tackle unbelievably complex and difficult issues like never before. They are fearless. They're often one third or one quarter of my age on average. But they're saying we've got to deal with this. And we're not going to be shy and frightened because of ingrained power structures that somehow create massive inequities in society. And they said, no, we've got to do it for the sake of generations to come. We've got to be ready to change and we've got to take it on ourselves. Nobody else is going to do it for us. Any of that assumption that somehow benign government will sort things out and promote equity, no way. That's not, that's not the shape of the world. So it's the emergence, number one, of a generation of people who are not scared of complexity, not scared of power games, and not scared of some of the artificial divisions of our life into different academic disciplines. Secondly, those people have learned the power of working across disciplines and sectors. They're learning the liberating nature of intersectoral working and how it gives just an incredible amount of extra leverage. Thirdly, there's only four things. They've learned that if you put equity at the center, you begin to hit the core truth of what we need to deal with in public health. All analyses show us that people who are poorer, people with less power, people whose rights are not realized, get bad health as an automatic outcome of being in just a terribly disadvantaged position. It's not their fault at all. It's just if you're poor, if your rights are not realized, if you're discriminated against, you're going to be sicker. And so we come to the fourth point, which is incorporating this all into what we need to focus on for the future. Num uh, ignore slogans like build back better. Terrible slogan. You know, we don't want to go backwards. Not to anything. Backwards got us into this mess, the COVID mess, the climate mess, the nature destruction mess. No. We want to go forward. We want to go fast. And we want it to be fair. So fast, forward, fair is my motto. And every time I see Bill Backblasher on a brief, I cross it out and I put FFF. Because Me too. I'm I hated on. this. Building back. Um, oh, no good. Way. Oh, building no forward. Way. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Much and I want better. fair. I want fair in there. Because, or just, much, I don't care what way. Because that's the thing that we have to fight for right at the centre. Mandy, there you go. Build forward better, faster, and fairer. She's combined the two. Thank you, Mandy, as always. You pull us out of the But that's me. I'm optimistic because there's a huge community of people who are starting to think is of course fighting against various forces that don't even want to define them. But instead of saying they're so bad, we have to give up. The mood around now is they are bad and they're creating a mess, but that means we have to work harder. That's what great. Thank you so much, both of you for your passionate and incredible leadership. And we will join you at the COP. Uh, with, with a whole army of health professionals and healthcare workers in support of the vision that we're all articulating today. So thanks so much and thanks for your leadership. Sounds so to, great, thank you. Yes, uh, so to close it out, um, I wanna introduce you to a special woman. Mia Kami is a 22 year old singer songwriter from the island of Tonga. She currently studying law and politics at the University of South Pacific in Fiji. And she's passionate about the importance of indigenous knowledge, decolonizing the mind and climate activism. She incorporates her passions into her music 
and uses it as a platform to bring light to the issues affecting the Pacific in the only way music can. Let's hear from Mia. Honolele, my name is Mia Kami and I am a proud Tongan from the beautiful islands of Tonga here in the South Pacific. But I'm currently based in Suva, which is the capital of Fiji. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the Skull Forum for giving me the space to share and to tell my story through my original song called Healing. And this particular song, it speaks on how we as Pacific people, as indigenous people, as people of color, our past is littered in hurt and oppression. And so the message of the song is that the healing process has started and it has to continue. We have to continue healing from the hurt of our past to ensure that our future generations can thrive in such a way that we might not have been able to in this current generation. But what I'd like the song to show is that we in the Pacific, we're on the front lines of this climate crisis and while our healthcare is accessible and it's available to majority of the population, this pandemic has shown that there are limitations on what's accessible to us. And so leaders must ensure that our healthcare systems are resilient in these times of change, in these times of this climate crisis, in these times of this pandemic. And so I hope this song speaks to you in such a way that it encourages action and I hope that you like the song as well. Thank you again for having me. I hope you enjoy the song. I have a question. It's a little hard to ask, but even harder to get answered. I have a question What if the roles were reversed And the victors didn't come first Where would we be? Just because it's unfamiliar Doesn't mean it's not normal either It's just how you're taught to think Our voices pushing for better choices No longer silent Time to start healing Healing from the hurt Time to keep fighting For what we deserve This system's not changing So we must be the first to put one foot forward Start moving forward By healing from the hurt Start healing from the hurt Hey I have a question What if you walked in my shoes And saw we have so much more to lose would you finally see just because it's unfamiliar doesn't mean it's not normal either it's just how you see your world here we are lifting our voices pushing for better choices no longer silent Time to start healing, healing from the hurt. Time to keep fighting for what we deserve. The system's not changing, so we must be the first to put one foot forward. Start moving forward by healing from the Healing from the hurt. Mm, I'm healing from the hurt. Just be.
because it's unfamiliar doesn't mean it's not normal either it's just how it's hard to think here we are lifting our voices pushing for better choices no longer silent time to start you thank you so much mia way a beautiful way to to send us off on our way and i want to thank everybody all the panelists and all the people who came to this session for your attention and your passion and your support in wherever you find yourself from healing from the hurt and the healing that we can do together on the planet so enjoy the rest of the skull forum and carry forward and keep the faith Thanks very much.